Okay, so welcome back to the Cracks in Postmodernity. Today, we're going to talk with Sean Demensic. Did I say it right? Yes. Perfect. Uh, who is the director of Tredeste and co-founder of the Catholic Worker in Lancaster. So Sean, before we talk a little bit about Catholic social teaching in the context of the U.S., just tell us some of your background and about the stuff that you've been working on lately. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I was born and raised not too far from where I am in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I, uh, you know, live here at the at Holy Family Catholic Worker uh, here in the city. Um, work full time with the Amish. Uh, many people always ask when Lancaster comes up, do you know any Amish? I do indeed. Um, but uh, yeah, I spend a lot of my time uh, with Tradiste and uh, the work that I do there promoting Catholic social teaching and the sort of uh, tradition of uh, the church's social teaching and trying to to break that down and express that for people. Um, I have a podcast as well as a website with various sort of resources um, and both trying to, to boil it down into sort of manageable uh, bits for the, the common person who hasn't necessarily the, the time or background to slog through a bunch of uh, papal encyclicals and such. Um, but also uh, another goal as well with Tradiste, there's a number of people, volunteers, uh, worker scholars um, who are involved, uh, who our goal is to not only talk about these ideas and promote them, but try to put them into practice and form communities around uh, living them out. So that's maybe a, a good summary of what we're all about. Yeah. And when I first went on your website, it became really clear to me that your reading of the Catholic Church's social doctrines is really nuanced and doesn't really fall into these polemical camps that most American Catholics fall into. And, you know, I was saying this before that not all the people who listen to this podcast are Catholic or religious necessarily, but I think what unites a lot of people is this kind of skepticism towards the standard left-right neoliberal narrative. And again, it's, it's frustrating, especially for Catholics, to see that there are so many vocal people in the church in the U.S., who will, whose starting point is really the platforms of the Democratic or Republican parties. And then they'll sprinkle a little bit of Catholic social teaching or Catholic mm -hmm. morality on top, rather than starting from their experience of faith, starting from their experience of the church as this lived community, and then entering into politics from there. So I would just want to start by asking you, like, why do you think it's very difficult for us as Americans to understand Catholic social teaching for what it is, rather than starting from these kind of secular political platforms? Yeah, definitely. No, great question. I mean, I think that we could, we could talk at greater length about that left-right economy, because I think that's something that more than just as Americans really kind of defines our experience of modernity, broadly speaking, and, and the, uh, you know, in, in many ways limits our imagination for what the, not just politics, but sort of all of reality is. Um, but more specifically within the American paradigm, I mean, everyone's familiar, you know, with the American two-party system and mm -hmm. uh, the kind of uh, narratives that are built around that system. And our media, in, especially since the 1950s in America and the sort of creation of uh, a really distinctive sort of propaganda machine from these various sections of the mainstream media um, has been, that, that, that's very pronounced. And I think it's really affected what the American experience of church has been, and, and uh, specifically the Catholic experience. Um, going back even to Vatican II, you know, there was a uh, uh, Father Blake, he has a, a new book out from Word on Fire, and he has a really good description of um, the sort of council of the media that occurred and the, the fact that um, most of us aren't actually experiencing Christianity or Catholicism for, you know, what it, for even necessarily what it is in like the, the diversity of our own church community. Um, because we're so atomized, you know, we just show up to church on Sundays, um, and certainly not for like the 2000 year tradition that the church is, we're really getting the, the vast majority of our experience of church is happening on social media. And so the different thinkers, the different uh, talking heads or, or YouTube stars or podcasters that we follow is our main experience of what it means to be a Catholic, it means to be a Christian. Um, and that I think is really at the heart of it, because 
that controls that narrative. And obviously those people in competing for attention on social media have a very, very strong uh, pull to align themselves with either of the two dominant voices and narratives in social media, which is either the uh, progressive liberal, you know, left side or the uh, conservative reactionary right wing side of the church. So I think that's really what captures us in that that paradigm, specifically in our time. And it's gotten worse as the internet and social media has taken more, over more and more of our daily lives. Yeah, I think this is a key point that like there's this pressure to kind of adopt one of these more uh, mainstream narratives or outlooks because you know it's more commercially viable it gets more attention um but the reality is that i mean christianity is not an ideology it's not just a set of rules or rituals it's i mean it's a, a shared life it's centered around this presence centered around god, god actually coming to live amongst us and i think you know just thinking about the catholic workers tradition the fact that not only do you engage in activism or acts of charity, but there's clarification of thought, there's opportunity to come together and talk about these principles and what they really mean for us as humans and for our communities. And I think with what you're saying about social media, like if our engagement with the principles of Catholic social teaching is only on the internet, then that's really exacerbating this ideological bent towards, you know, this way of reading the faith. So I, um, I wonder for you, like actually working with the Catholic worker, um, what's your experience like of clarification of thought and like really engaging in meaningful discussions about these ideas? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say it kind of takes place in a few different levels because um, there's sort of the, you know, constant clarifications of thought that just happened between myself and other members of uh, the, the physical location that we live in, the, the community. Um, and then, of course, there's also things that take place, you know, really excellent discussions and uh, things that I coordinate through Tradiste. And, and that's part of, you know, having people on the podcast or, or just reaching out to other people and trying to grow in a deeper understanding of what the church teaches and, uh, and what Catholic social teaching is. Um, but I think definitely living in community has been a real blessing. And, and this is something that happens in, you know, ha has always happened through the Catholic worker tradition, people who are motivated and impelled by these truths coming together and living in community and practicing them living them out praying together and that also includes talking together and i think there's been enormous fruit uh from that i mean i've just experienced that personally with the other members of the house and even the house itself was kind of born out of discussions and conversations that we started began with in-person conversations where we were talking about okay here's values ideals that we want to live out um how do we do that? And, and it was ultimately born out of uh, those sorts of in-person clarifications of thought. Uh, and then, of course, we also host um, roundtables. You know, this Catholic worker tradition hosting roundtable discussions uh, for that, that idea of the clarification of thought. And we do that here every Friday at the house. And uh, again, those have been a great blessing. Uh, we often have people who are non-Catholics joining us there. And so we have all sorts of great discussions. And sometimes they're more uh, casual discussions, sometimes they're heated debates or theological topics, but I find that there's always, uh, always things I'm learning through that. And I think a key aspect of that is that um, that happens through an in-person encounter that I think so much of the, uh, the richness of these conversations happens because they're conversations between friends. They're not just fighting your enemies on social media and trying to score as many likes as possible as you own them with quote tweets or whatever. And that's sadly what most, maybe not most, but certainly a lot of debate and uh, conversation even is reduced to when it's put into this public square where there's not an assumption that anyone's necessarily friends. And there's kind of this constant uh, pull towards demonizing each other and dehumanizing each other because you can get likes and you know satisfaction out of uh, doing that. And so that I think is something that uh, I think we've underestimated just like how much discourse has been destroyed by these by, by the, that dynamic of it being put into social media uh, where it's not happening, where there's any degree of real friendship or uh, sort of shared common seeking the truth. Yeah, and it also, 
it takes work to actually live in those relationships and it's not mm -hmm. as glamorous as you know having this kind of internet presence um but it, again it goes back to the real nature of christianity as communion life shared together um and it just it makes me think about again it's like these ideological reductions of Christianity to like, you know, you pick a position on some hot button issue, like whether it's abortion or I don't know, like social welfare, it kind of occludes the fact that Christianity is not, again, a list of positions to take. It's it's about this ontological reality, this, this way of perceiving reality um, through the lens of the presence of Christ, through this encounter. Um, I don't know. So I, I wonder for you, like living this communal life, how does it shape your vision of reality, your vision of the everyday, uh, the way you look at people and their, I don't know, their circumstances? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, one aspect of being with someone physically, you know, just that sort of incarnational reality of, of being uh, in a place uh, with a person um, and, and with an actual person, not just like an avatar, right, or a, a user um, of a social media site is that you're existing in the real world, you're, you're doing that encounter in a world that is ultimately given to us by God. Um, whereas social media, the uh, our, our sort of contexts for conversation are ultimately a man made sort of uh, reality. And so I think that um, something that's really important about both community life and this gets into another aspect of the catholic worker which is that you know the works of mercy and and the service of the poor um that it does need to be embodied and, and incarnational and not not mediated through exclusively man-made creations whether that's um social media or some sort of uh bureaucratic welfare agency that you nobly donate a certain amount of money to um, the fact of your personally having an encounter with another person is, I think, essential to understanding the truth about reality, whether it's in conversation or whether it's just uh, the truth of who another person is or um, of, of what their experience of the world is, what it has to teach us, and especially when that's their experience of, of poverty um, or of suffering. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I don't know if that gets exactly to the question that you're asking, but in terms of that ontological reality that there's by learning about things through the the created world as given to us by god we have a perspective that is always going to be distorted when we try to do that through uh man-made creations um which are in you know not that those things are essentially bad but certainly in their reality in the world that we exist are tyrannical in, in the, the way that they're not ordered towards the common good and so um yeah, they, they give us a, a deeply confused sense of reality. Yeah, and so what I hear you're saying is that mm, understanding Christ as this ontological presence that, you know, manifests itself in these encounters with other people, um, it kind of produces this conversion in us, like, in the sense that it changes our way of seeing, but also our way of living, our way of relating to people and to things around us. And I think part of going back to what you're saying about modernity, and I guess the kind of neoliberal political binary, is that it, I feel like it cuts us off from the possibility of conversion because it's so rooted in the self. Like the self is the point of departure for almost everything. Um, and it makes me think about like, this is part of the reason why when American Catholics are looking at Rerum Novarum or the social compendium, it's very easy to just cherry pick like, you know, little pieces that are convenient for our, um, the view that are, we already have, rather than looking at the more essential parts, like thinking of subsidiarity, like this is a very radical principle. I rarely hear it spoken about though, um, in kind of mainstream circles. So I'm curious for you, like, what does it mean to you to live out the principle of subsidiarity and why do you think it's challenging for a lot of us to to understand it and to live it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that um, subsidiarity is sadly, you know, deeply uh, misunderstood. You know, it, it's often uh, 
kind of used to mean is sometimes it's sort of co-opted to be a libertarian thing and, and people say oh subsidiarity means small government it means limited government in like the way that the american founders wanted it and they were really you know crypto catholics um you know that's that's a real take that, that people throw out there and then there's um you know maybe a sort of more progressive view of subsidiarity that really seems sees it um kind of just as a uh uh, a bone that's being thrown to the existence of the private sector and saying like, oh, well, we won't do full, uh, uh, you know, nationalizing everything, but rather we'll have just, you know, the existence of some degree of, of you know, market socialism or something like that. Um, and again, that, that's it being co-opted into these two sort of frameworks, really. And you're right that subsidiarity is very radical um, and very poorly understood. And the key principle of it is a great, a great summation I've heard. I didn't come up with this myself, but is the phrase um, as small as possible, as big as necessary mm -hmm. um, in terms of how we uh, govern and, and order society. Um, but maybe, a, maybe another good way of understanding it is through the lens of uh, what Peter Marin, co-founder of the Catholic Worker, called personalism, which yeah. is the notion that uh, the human person uh, is really at the center, um, in some sense, um, of, of political life. Um, the common good, of course, is sort of what we're all ordered to, but the common good always has to include the good of the human person, um, and you're not allowed to sacrifice individuals to the, uh, the greater good of, of some proclaimed common good. And um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different directions we could go there. I mean, subsidiarity applies in how a father raises his children, right? So it, it's very practical on that level. It applies to how we try to make decisions as uh, members of a community here at the Catholic Worker. Um, and it also applies to how we ought to think about uh, politics and economics and what our sort of vision of, of the world should be. So um, yeah, there's really a lot of different directions uh, that we could go there. Um, but I think an important, maybe an, a great way to to understand it as well. Well, actually, I, I should maybe ask you to clarify your question because I could talk a long time about go down various rabbit trails about subsidiarity. So, yeah, I mean, I think like when I look at Dorothy Day's reading of Pope Leo, I think what she's really hitting on is the importance of responsibility mm -hmm. because she. I think this is like, and this is like the kind of difference between like her shift from pure communism to the position of the church that like there's this deep seated need to be um, interested in the suffering of the poor. Like this is part of our humanity, but do we create a kind of government structure that guarantees that this suffering will be eliminated? Or is it my personal responsibility going back to Morin and the personalism to attend to the suffering of my neighbor and to create a structure myself, not waiting for the government to do it. Um, I don't know, I feel like it's challenging because at least in America in a very kind of technocratic society, I think we're trained to offlay our responsibilities onto some higher entity. Because to take responsibility, it's risky. Like you need to really depend on other people to learn how to care for other people. It's, you know, there's too much, um, too much that could go wrong. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think I'm just very interested in this, like this fear of responsibility that we have. And like, I see it in myself, especially like I see that my instinct is to go to some higher entity to look to a yeah. bureaucracy to solve it. But I don't know, like what you're living at the Catholic Worker, it's, this is why I'm saying it's radical. Like it goes against this impulse to put this off onto some higher abstract dehumanized entity, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, subsidiarity is a critique both of us, you know, our personal sort of attitudes towards uh, the plight of the poor and also towards uh, our sort of grand political vision and everything in our sort of mass society of, of modernity. Um, and so, you know, it, it yeah, responsibility is, a, is another great way of framing it in that it does require a, you know, the acknowledgement of subsidiarity is that as fallen human beings, um, what you really need in to, to create a, a better world, you know, a, a more perfect world, a world where 
of, you know, the kingdom is broken in and, you know, God's will is done on, on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus says, um, is that you need virtuous people, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need people that do take up that responsibility towards their neighbor and towards God, towards uh, themselves and live it out. And there's no, there's no way we, we have very much a sense in modernity. And this is across the spectrum, right? That if we impose the perfect system, yeah. then we would fix the problem, you know, whether it's like, you know, we eliminate the state, and we have the free market determine everything, or we, you know, eliminate the market, and we have the state determine everything. Um, either way, uh, there's a sense that if we just had the right thing, and we directed it toward, you know, the right good, whatever good that is, um, it would work, right. But ultimately, uh, we know that that's not the case, right? Like we see the sort of uh, modernity is in many ways a sort of horror story of these systems and you can look in many different examples from the like you know the 19th century British factories to uh, Soviet communism um, to, to the sort of American blend of uh, you know a, a powerful centralized state as well as a, a global capitalist market that exists today um, and so in either case you have all the sort of carnage that's been been wrought by that sort of system. Whereas what you really need, like the actual solution is always going to be virtue. Like you, you can't mm -hmm. cheat the game and, and get away with creating a good world without people yeah. who are actually good and holy and, and loving people. So. Yeah. And I think that's the stumbling block for a lot of us because it's very easy to talk about the right positions that you're taking and especially to virtue signal on social media or whatever, but to live, to, to be converted personally, um, you know, again, it's this risk and yeah. And I, like I was saying before, I see how much, like I grew up in a very, I guess, kind of like very comfortable bourgeois suburban environment where it was made clear to me that like when conflicts arise, when they're suffering, like you look to this higher bureaucratic structure mm -hmm to solve it because if you try to do it it's too risky you might get hurt it's too scary like and i i don't know i mean i know that's not everybody in america's reality but i just see for a lot of people who come from a similar background from my generation it's like this mentality not only is it morally problematic but it's kind of debilitating like it, it kind of robs you of your agency to just figure things out on your own and feel like a person Mm -hmm. you know and that's that's like as much as i'm challenged by what dorothy what pope leo are saying like it's also very empowering to be challenged mm -hmm. in that way you know yeah um and, and i was yeah, an understanding for for a catholic and, and for the sort of catholic vision of virtue is that virtue is not a set of uh you know sort of just like you know rules that you know you you get like the right tally of mm -hmm. of things and then at the end of your life you get judged on it but rather like your happiness actually lies in virtue and you'll ultimately be happy or miserable both in this life and in the next based on whether or not you're a virtuous person and so um yeah like like you said like it's ultimately empowering it's something that is seeking to you know create uh, you know not so, not even create virtuous people but rather um encourage and enable people to be virtuous um and rely on their virtue to make the world a better place um, and the, the sort of argument against that many people would say is that, oh, well, you know, people, well, people aren't going to be virtuous, they're going to do wrong. And so we need some kind of system that we can impose so that it prevents anything from going wrong. But I think the problem there is that, uh, and again, this is the, the brilliant critique of subsidiarity on the political level is that, you know, that's it, whatever system is going to be imposed is going to be imposed by human beings. Like they're the only ones to impose it, right? Like there's God and there's his order of society. And this is what he's given us, right? Like the opportunity for virtue. And then there's, uh, you know, men who can uh, impose a, a system, but if they impose a system different than the one God is, if they're, if they're you know, trying to sort of create their own idolatry, you know, their own system um, of perfection, rather than just translating and handing down the one that God has given them, then, you know, it's then if they're vicious, then it's going to be horrible, right? Like it's going to do horrible things as it, um, you know, translates, they're going to become tyrants, right? Um, then there's no way you can get out of that, right? Like you're always going to have the potential for evil leaders to be tyrannical. 
um, no system is going to fix that other than than virtue, right? Uh, so that I think is a key uh, a key aspect of of sub, like that subsidiarity really recognizes. Yeah, and the other thing about Dorothy that's kind of intriguing is that I think for Americans it's very easy to try to pick pieces of her life that kind of fit again one of these uh polemical visions when really like she lives this total synthesis between you know orthodoxy when it comes to doctrine to worship to prayer um but radical social action these aren't two separate things for her uh, they're very much one Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, well, I don't know, when I look at things like this kind of debate over the Latin mass that's going on today, it's strange to me because, you know, I tend to be drawn to that more traditional liturgy. Um, and yeah, like, and I take the church's doctrine seriously, like, I don't think heterodoxy is something useful. But when you look at the mainstream, it's like people who advocate for Latin mass, people who are, you know, doctrinally orthodox are pigeonholed as these neoconservatives who don't really care much about, you know, certain social issues, whereas the Catholics who worry about social issues, you know, think that the traditional doctrine is problematic and can be flouted, at, you know, according to our whims. So when I look at someone like Dorothy, it's like, this makes so much sense to me but why is this not registering for the rest of us yeah what, what do you make of that kind of again this binary between like doctrine liturgy versus social realities yeah yeah i mean i think it it plays into um those you know that like the, just the polarization that exists generally but i think it does go deeper than that that um like something at the core of modernity generally is this kind of the, the divide of left right mm -hmm. kind of goes along the lines of this emphasis on order and hierarchy that you see from the right yeah. right and then this emphasis on uh liberation right that that you see on the left um you know and and the resistance against tyranny that you see and both on both sides there's a an easy temptation that we're kind of caught between I mean, there's that famous, I think it's C.S. Lewis quote about, you know, the devil sending out heirs in the, into the world by pairs so that, you know, when people are attracted to one, um, they swing around to the other and, and go back and forth. And I, and I think that's very true, and particularly in this case where, you know, you have on the right, and I don't just mean like on the political right, I mean sort of on the theological right even, you know, and, and not just like in 21st century America, but I think you can trace this all the way back. Uh, in some sense to the Reformation, but certainly through the Enlightenment and many moments throughout history is you have people who are sort of, sort of fixated on hierarchy and they see any kind of movement for, you know, a radical liberation as dangerous and they want to sort of stamp it out in defense of the hierarchy. Um, and then on the left side, you know, you have this, this uh, emphasis on liberation um, and any idea of hierarchy is something that needs to be Eliminated, eliminated because it stands in the way of liberation. And uh, the church is something that transcends that, right? Like the church is a hierarchical institution. We believe Jesus founded it that way. Um, and yet at the same time is also something, uh, of an institution of liberation is something dedicated to the preferential option for the poor. And we see that in Christ's own preaching. Like there's some, there's things that if you look at it from a modern lens, you won't be able to understand. He says, you know, at the one hand that uh, he's coming as a king, right, you know, and that he's going to set the apostles on the 12 tribes or the, the seats of the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uses all of this sort of hierarchical noble language, and yet at the same time, you know, preaches that he's coming to bring good news to the captives, and that he's coming, uh, you know, to uh, set, set them free, and he, he comes and speaks to the sinners and prostitutes and etc., um, and those are tropes that you hear on both sides of this divide, and neither of them want to reconcile with the other aspects of Jesus' ministry and teaching. And so um, I think Dorothy is just in a modern example of something that we see, and she's a particularly good example, though I, I don't, you know, I don't want to downplay that of uh, transcending that, you know, where uh, like saints are the people who, I mean, of course, many Catholics are not 
living out the the perfect church and the perfect teachings of Christ as he called us to. And, and I'm not, that's something I'm constantly seeking to improve in. But what I'm seeking to follow in the example of is the saints who did live that out. And they live out the synthesis of, you know, of hierarchy and liberation. Um, and that's, that's very distinct in the modern world. And it, it's not a, um, many people will kind of frame it on both sides as uh, a confusion. They'll say, oh, Dorothy was trying to be an Orthodox Catholic, but maybe she was a little bit too influenced by her communist past. I've heard conservative Catholics say that. And then progressives will say, oh yeah, she was a great woman, uh, you know, beautiful life of service and great political vision, but she, she was a little bit too gung-ho about uh, the church hierarchy or things like that. She didn't, she didn't understand the spirit of, of Vatican II that was to come, or she wasn't, she, you know, she, she had a lot to learn from, from, you know, the church after her death or whatever. And um, both of them are trying to uh, sort of uh, take away from that and, and sort of shunt her into their, their camps. But in fact, uh, it's not that she's incoherent. Uh, it's just that she's living a coherence that is rarely lived in the modern world, but she holds a great example of, of what that canon should look like for a Catholic. Yeah. No, so I think it's, it's precisely this, that this synthesis between hierarchy and liberation, like it's a total paradox and yet mm -hmm. it's, it's real. It's true. You know? And I think that's, I think that is the scandal of someone who is so coherent like Dorothy Day um because for her like obedience it's not just blindly following doctrines or bishops because you're supposed to like it's obedience to christ in the person whether it's you know the teachings the teachings of the bishop or the pope on like morals and uh and faith or obedience to the need of my neighbor who's suffering like this is one issue they're not two separate things mm -hmm. or you know i find interesting like when you're reading her diaries when like in the 60s and 70s when hippies start to come to the catholic worker and they have yeah. this vision of liberation of the body through sexuality and she's really scandalized because she's like well how are you going to serve the poor like if you're not living virtue in your own personal mm -hmm. life like isn't this a contradiction to live virtue socially but not personally yeah. um and i it makes me think a lot about the current papacy because Francis, like in one homily, he'll be, he'll be speaking about the, you know, the corrupt power of major corporations. So we're talking about, you know, climate change. And then he'll talk about gender theory. He'll talk about the dignity of sexuality and the body. And people are like, oh, I thought he was liberal. I thought he was this. I thought he was that. But like, there's a very clear line connecting all these issues when you read Laudato Si or Querida Amazonia. Like there's this sense that the body, um, community, family, these things are given to us and that, you know, destroying the environment, allowing certain corporations to have too much power, like it's a threat to this. These aren't two different issues. And yet, again, like in America, we have a very strange way of reading his social doctrines um so I'm, I'm just curious for you like you know being involved in the catholic work or knowing dorothy and peter's writings like what's your take on francis's social encyclicals and his you know his teachings in general yeah um i'll speak specifically on his social encyclicals and i, I think that you know you're on the mark there in, in what you're you're saying and recognizing the sort of deeper coherence of these things. And I mean, uh, I, I've, you know, remember reading Potter Edmund uh, pointing out that uh, Laudato Si, it, you know, it's an environmental encyclical and, and many uh, conservatives lambasted it as, you know, the church falling into progressivism, but in many ways is the most uh, anti-modern yeah. encyclical, you know, that, that's been around for you know, a long time, perhaps since uh, Leo the Thirteenth or, or so, um, and it's it's ultimately deeply skeptical of this modern project of uh, you could one way to frame it would be the denial of of subsidiarity, where um, you know rather than God's creative power and, and also His law sort of infusing all of creation, right? Like something that exists on on every level of society. Rather, we have ultimately 
given ourselves over to a man-made system of, of the technocratic paradigm is the word, the phrase that Pope Francis uses, right? And it's an attempt to create this sort of man-made reality. Uh, you know, ultimately, like, that's what all idolatry is, right? Um, and and that goes for on every topic, right? Like, it, it goes both for, you know, I mean, that applies to money and our uses of, uh, you know, the, those resources, and it applies to sexuality and, and sexual mores and, and everything. It applies to both how we use, I mean, a great connection can be made. There's some corporations, uh, you know, uh, development tech corporations um, that have made leaps and bounds both in birth control and in artificial fertilizers for, for crops, right? And, uh, you know, that, that climate issue is not unrelated to the, uh, you know, to, to the sexual revolution and to the attempt ultimately to master God's creation and turn it into something that's made in our image, right? Um, rather than, you know, obviously, yes, we're called to till and keep the garden. And that's something that Pope Francis addresses in the encyclical. And he says that, you know, that in, in the Christian tradition, that's never interpreted as, you know, that creation is just some neutral thing that we can mold however we want for the glory of God. Rather, that creation also came from God. We didn't make it. God did. He made us and he made creation. Yeah. And the creation also, God's law inheres in it. Um, and yeah, so we can't, and that, and that involves a certain, uh, you know, a subsidiarity in the sense of we need to pass down to nature the things that nature can handle, right? Like that's part of that very principle that we don't try to domineer and centralize all the creative powers of the earth in our own systems, but rather we work in harmony with them. Um, and I mean, again, this is a this is a huge topic that's difficult to fit into such a, a small conversation. But the I mean, I could point to a dozen different uh, resources on this topic. And my overall point would be that um, the Catholic Church in its social teaching and certainly in Laudato Si is an important discussion and development on this point is has a clear vision it's not just that the church has like a sort of interesting curious critique of modernity the church actually has a deeply coherent vision that addresses all these different interconnected issues of the modern world um and you see that again and again uh in from laudato si i mean going back to rerum navarro and you know everything in between and in dorothy's work and in many other holy men and women who have commented on it so yeah, I think I think that, if anything, is uh, what I would want to uh, point people to is that if they if they're seeing that uh, dichotomy and confusion in the social teaching of the church, then it's because they haven't escaped that paradigm of the modern world. Mm. So then I guess the last thing I'd want to ask you before we wrap up. So uh, Dorothy, in certain circumstances called herself a christian anarchist and and i think even in long loneliness she recognized there are a lot of different ways you could define it mm -hmm. um but i'm just curious to know for you what do you make of this anarchist position that she takes and do you think it's yeah what what do you think and do you think it's uh something that we can take seriously today mm -hmm. yeah i'd say maybe just to give some context to anarchism and the Catholic worker movement, you know, uh, for those familiar, Kropotkin, uh, uh, Peter Kropotkin was a, uh, he was a sort of Russian anarcho-communist uh, thinker um, with some really interesting ideas. And, and in some ways, he himself was kind of looping back around to a, uh, a vision that was, um, you know, much closer to Catholic social teaching than many of his peers. He was very influential on in Peter Marin. And Dorothy, um, and and I certainly his works are very uh, interesting, um, worthwhile reading if if not entirely you know on the money. But uh, so so I think that's part of it, like that her vision of anarchism is very informed by a particular uh, brand of that. It's not. I think people often confuse it because when we think anarchist, we often associate it with the kind of like Bakunin, uh, you know, more Western European uh anarchism that's very anti-institutional in every sense yeah. um rather than trying to recover this sense of society being built out of sort of voluntary associations um which is a big part of like the last section of ray Navarro is entirely about that um 
though notably i do want to say that uh the you know i don't i don't call myself an anarchist and peter marin didn't particularly call himself an anarchist either though he was you know very happy to reference kropotkin um and i think that's maybe one point where uh you know i'm not in uh, dorothy was very, very strict in her pacifism and i think that that very much informs her anarchism you know she was very uh, hard line on that topic um and i think there's a lot that, that's maybe a whole nother conversation but um ultimately i do think that Catholic social teaching does have a more nuanced position. I don't think that's a thing that that Dorothy has a sort of uh, total clarity on. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uh, important insights in in her position. So I don't want to you know denigrate it, but rather I do have a sort of you know much more nuanced view um, on the state. And ultimately, seeing I think Catholic social teaching sees the state uh, in the sense of not in the sense of the modern nation state, but the state in the sense of the polis, the political community that's ordered towards the common good is something that's uh, fundamentally good and that certainly can turn into a tyranny and in its form of the modern nation state, which Dorothy was very active and noble for critiquing, um, you know, is, is turned into a tyranny, but is something that can be uh, rightly ordered. And so that's, I think, uh, you know, just a central difference that I would uh, take from, from that sort of anarchist position. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's important to mention that her pacifist position was, yeah, like was really radical and um, hard to live for sure, but she had, um, she gave very clear reasons for it, you know, and I think it's worth taking seriously, even if we can't say we align ourselves completely with it, you know. I think an important thing too is that that sort of pacifism, you know, I think it's people get caught in this binary of they're either, you know, anti pacifist or pacifist, you know, and, and I think that, you know, by all means, pacifism is good. And there are many people who are called to live pacifism very in, in the total radical sense to not take up arms. And I think that we as Christians, like that's something that ultimately comes out of the Christian tradition and of uh, certainly in the in the early church, but in monastic and in uh, the holy orders, right? Like that's a that's a, a central part of that that they can't take up arms. And I think we have to uh, a sort of nuanced understanding of grace and nature. I think in Catholic theology means that we ought to have a a sort of a prepare a preparedness of mind towards pacifism and a willingness to. Um, certainly live that out if Christ calls us to. And even if we're not called to it, uh, we need to be kind of infusing it into our lives. So just as a, you know, a married person isn't meant to live uh, celibacy, right? They are meant to have that virtue of chastity um, in such a way that they could uh, live out celibacy if they were, they were called to it. Um, Likewise, you know, all of us should have a, even if we're not necessarily called to, you know, swear never to take up arms, um, we should have a, an understanding that first they can only be taken up for the common good, right, you know, for the sake of justice, never for our own sort of private uh, gain in any way. Um, and also that that abhorrence of violence um, is, is something good, right, there's something healthy there in that we should be, we shouldn't have a desire to, to do violence. Um, but we should have a desire for justice, ultimately. And that, I think, you know, the critique of the modern military complex and everything is something that, you know, I'm entirely uh, on board with and, and something that I think Dorothy's witness to is extremely important in this, you know, in in, in an age of uh, a pagan empire that rules the world, like that our witness against that sort of system of bloodshed should be very clear, regardless of where we fall on that uh the specifics of that sort of total pacifism and anarchism yeah so whether we um agree with it fully or not like i think it's clear that this is a prophetic witness that she's giving yes. us you know something that we have to reckon with yeah so so that being said sean was there any plugs that you want to give before we we head out yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, if people are interested in what we're working on, um, they can go to uh, Tradiste. There's the Tradiste podcast. Um, I think we put out our 49th episode uh, today. So there's a bunch of backlog that people can go through, kind of see what it's about. Um, there's various easy essays on the site. We have the Ecological Ember Tides, the uh, Manifesto of the New Traditionalism, a few various kind of projects of Tradiste. Um, 
there's an you know Tradiste sort of community, uh, so to speak, a network of people, and I encourage there's opportunities for worker scholars to get involved if they're interested in uh, being involved with what Tradiste is doing and trying to live these ideas out. Um, so yeah, I'd say those are the uh, the main. You can obviously follow us on all the the social media, though I encourage you uh, not to follow us too closely on social media. Don't be too logged on, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's the main thing. And um, I'd also throw a plug out to uh, New Polity as well. Um, they likewise, they have a magazine, uh, which I've contributed to. They have you know a yearly conference, um, a podcast uh, with really great stuff. Um, they're great guys and um, I always enjoy their work and uh, yeah, have had a great time getting to know them as well. And they're in a very similar vein to everything I've been talking about. Awesome. Well, Sean, thank you for joining us and sharing uh, a lot of your, your vision and, and the work you're doing, which is really encouraging. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you, Stephen. And yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed. Awesome.